Hey everybody, this is another Summer with the Psalms reflection here at Oslo International Church. My name is Mike Steuernagel, I'm the pastor at OIC and I'm at Bakkehauen Church every Sunday now in July for our service. And I'm reflecting on each Sunday on one of the songs, prayers from the book of Psalms in the Bible. If, if you can't make it to our gathering though, you can still hear what I'm sharing through these videos. Just be sure to follow us on Instagram or subscribe to our YouTube channel and you're good to go. So, I, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with the news. I, I don't even know if I should call it that anymore. <laughs> Back in the day, checking the news meant reading a newspaper. Nowadays, news comes to us through all sorts of channels and media. And, and I check the news pretty much every day. I think it's important to have at least an idea of at least the big events going on and keep more or less informed. Uh, the thing though is that it can become some, somewhat overwhelming. Uh, because we have access to so much information all the time, it feels like there's so much going on. I guess I don't help it very much by the fact that because I have family spread all over the world, I daily check the news in Norway, North America, Brazil, and Europe. Because I feel like nothing much ever happens in Austria where my brother lives, so I just kind of try and check Europe as a whole. And, and doing that, it's kind of like an inverted depression lottery in which the chances of you not winning are extremely low. There's so much going on that it seems hard to know how to deal with it all. And perhaps it's just because information is so quick to spread and that has sort of a catalyzing effect. But perhaps it's also because these are issues that I care deeply about. But I feel like there's so much important things going on or, or maybe not just going on now, but coming to light to which things to which I need to, to decide how to, to react. There is there's Black Lives Matter and the painful assessing of systemic racism. There's all the developments of which the Me Too movement is an expression that have to do with our need to reckon with the deeply ingrained sexism and patriarchalism in our societies. There's the coronavirus pandemic and the way vulnerable populations are being hard hit and at places offered as sacrifice on economy's altar. There's the hyperpolarization in politics and the way it's breaking friendships and families. There's the plight of immigrants and refugees, which has not been made any easier by the pandemic. There's a reckoning with how destructive our patterns of consumption and production have been to the planet we live in and what that means for future generations. And it's, ah, there's so much injustice. It's hard not to feel powerless and, and get these, you know, John Mayer feelings, right? Now we see everything that's going wrong with the world and those who lead it. We just feel like we don't have the means to rise above and beat it. So we keep waiting, waiting, waiting on the world to change. Right? How do we deal with this? How do we deal with all of this? In the Lord, I take refuge. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth his eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. On the wicked, he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous, he loves justice. The upright will see his face. This is Psalm 11 of David. And even though we might find issue with some of the imagery and language here, like the whole fiery coals and burning sulfur thing, we also recognize some of the dilemma. And, and it's important to remember that David is speaking within a cost context that is accustomed to violence as a means of exerting justice, also when it comes to, to deities, right? Uh, my point is it's important to remember that David is speaking from and into an ancient world of which he was a part. 
uh, which is to say he is addressing the issues of his day with the language of his day, which is what we are trying to do as well. Uh, so, so then the question is, has this ancient song uh, any relevance then for our current struggle with injustice? Well, as, as you may have noticed, if, if you've heard me preach on the Psalms before, I, I often start by trying to understand how the Psalm frames its content. Uh, form is important when, when dealing with language, especially so when dealing with poetic expression. But we don't only miss beauty when we don't attend to form, we actually lose meaning. If you're only looking for something inside the pot, you might miss out on the fact that the potter might actually want you to pay attention to the pot itself. And I find that openings and closings are often important in the poetic structure of the Psalms. And here David starts with, In the Lord I take refuge. And he ends with, for the Lord is righteous, he loves justice, the upright will see his face. So the psalmist addresses God on the issue of justice and righteousness because he believes God to be righteous, to actually love, that is care about justice and to work towards it and to be a refuge for those who seek justice. And it is within that frame that the psalmist brings the issue before God. And the issue is, in the face of injustice, what should one choose? Fight or flight? Stay your ground or retreat? Understanding that frame is important because it helps us approach the psalm uh, differently. Rather than expecting the psalm to tell us what we should do, the psalm can be a source of wisdom for thinking how we can act, whether in fight or flight, how we can act in a way that is faithful to God. What does this mean? Uh, in, the, in the face of injustice, can we really talk about flight in a way that is faithful to a God who loves justice? Uh, and I guess this is a, is a point in the point in which it might be helpful to acknowledge that the word flight might not be ideal. I've been using it mostly because it relates to, to that instinct uh, of ours, to so that sort of that feeling on your in your stomach. Uh, and also because it sounds good, you know, flight, flight, of course. Uh, but should we, should we retreat in the face of injustice? I guess it depends what you mean by that. Uh, there is a kind of, of retreat that is the result of fear. And, and I'm not sure I want to call that a problem or, or a coward's choice when it stems from a real genuine fear. There is a survival instinct connected to that. And sometimes what one needs in such a case is just time and more understanding. Understanding what is behind the fear uh, and sort of deconstructing the feeling enough to be able to take a different approach. But there is also the flight associated with self-centeredness, to, to retreat because we don't want to risk ourselves, even if the cause is just, or because we aren't even willing to consider the justice of the cause if it may by any chance bring risk to myself. When we'd rather protect our bodies, our rights, and our privileges than recognize the inherent value in the bodies, rights, and privilege of the other who is suffering injustice. And by doing that, risk ourselves for the sake of justice. That is not the kind of flight that is faithful to a God of justice. That is not the kind of retreat that is faithful to a God of justice. Then there is a different kind of retreat, uh, which is a, a retreat meant not to push backwards, but forward. This is the retreat of a child to the arm of a parent she trusts. Uh, in the kindergarten where my, my boys attended, they used to talk a lot about this, and they called it the circle of trust. So the child goes out and explores the world and experiences things and takes risks then it comes back to the parent for safety or to an adult it trusts for safety. But it's a healthy circle. 
Uh, and if it's a healthy circle, then the child doesn't stay there. They go to the parent, they go to the trusted adult to be reassured so that they can then go back out there and continue taking risks. It's not a flight from, but a flight to. Not from injustice, but towards the just God to be sure that we have our grounding for the fight. This is, this is the wise one who builds their house with a foundation on the rock, as Jesus tells the parable. The point is not avoiding the rain and the storm. The point is having a firm enough foundation to withstand it. In the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? It is precisely because the psalmist has this refuge that he is able to not flee. So then we fight, right? But again, it's important to ask what it means to do that. What does it mean to stand our ground in a way that is faithful to this God of justice? When answering the question, what can the righteous do? We might be tempted to answer, fight back. Make sure justice is imposed over the unjust. But we must ask, is that an answer faithful to the God of justice, who is also a God of grace, so that he may be also refuge? Or will it lead us to what Wendell Berry so skillfully asked, did you finish killing everybody who was against peace? In what may seem to us as a paradox, and how much spiritual wisdom there is in the paradoxes in our scriptures, in, in what may seem like a paradox, it is precisely the most uncomfortable and violent verses of this psalm that opened the way to a different way of fighting. Uh, for me, uh, when I read it. The psalmist asks for a rain of fiery coals and burning sulfur. It's a terrible thing to ask, of course. But the thing is, he asks. That is, his way, doing this is his way of asking that God do justice in a way that only God can. And if for him that would look like a rain of fiery coals, it does not entail that God has to agree with him. The thing with asking for God's judgment is that it means leaving judgment to God. The thing with asking for God's judgment is that it means leaving judgment to God. Like Prophet Jonah, we might find that God is more interested in life than death that he is more interested in redemption than punishment. The thing with asking for God's judgment is that it means leaving judgment to God. Understanding God's judgment for us Christians means looking to Christ. Understanding how God deals with injustice means looking to Christ. Understanding what it means to fight injustice means looking to Christ and the way we walk as people of Christ. Interestingly, interestingly enough, uh, the very image of fire from heaven actually shows up uh, in Luke 9 when the disciples feel like the Samaritans aren't behaving as they should and they actually ask Jesus if they should call fire down from heaven and destroy them. It's like eye roll emoji, right? Jesus does not rebuke the Samaritans. He rebukes the disciples. When, when Paul picks up the image of burning coals then in Romans 12, and this time he's quoting from Proverbs, it is in the context of talking about loving actions as we belong to the body of Christ. Bless those who persecute you. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. But it is, of course, Jesus who gives us the most challenging and 
integrated expression of fighting for justice and yet refusing to enact our understanding of justice through violence. In the Sermon of the Mount, his call is, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. And that call to love your enemies, it is smack in the middle of the Sermon of the Mount, the Sermon of the Mount that says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who persecute because of righteousness. You cannot serve both God and money. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. Build your house on the rock. What can the righteous do? What can we do? Well, while the wicked bend their bows, we can bend our hearts. While they shoot from the shadows, we can love in broad daylight and act mercy and grace in broad daylight. Because God is our refuge. And God isn't going anywhere. He's right there in the middle of it all. May the Lord bless us and keep us and make He make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may He turn His face towards you and your face towards the other. And may he bring us peace. Let us go in peace and serve the Lord joyfully.